Okay, so the last time we talked about Newton's method, right? So let me give you such a, again, a very brief recap. So we are in the business of minimizing some function where the G is a, a function of this kind of type. And all, all these numerical integrators we talked about in like is the first half of the course, they kind of get reduced to this, this type of problem, right? So now we are in the business of minimizing that. And we talked about a family of method called descent methods. So Newton's method is a descent method, but there are other descent methods like the gradient descent. And the last time we talked how the gradient descent is not always that good. So you really want to use the Newton's method, even though it's a little bit more complicated. And today I will talk about some of the complications. So the Newton, uh, the key idea of Newton is to use the descent direction that looks like this. So if D is a descent direction, it takes minus. Don't forget the minus there. <laughs> Uh, that there is a Hessian of the function g at some point xk, where we understand that xk is some current iterate. Now this is invert it and the gradient of g at that same point xk, wherever that is, okay? And you know that the, uh, the contract is that we are doing an iterative method, so we start at some initial guess x0, then we produce x1, then we produce x2, and so on, until we are sufficiently close to the minimum of g, and at which point we and okay so the the descent method that's one part of uh oh, sorry the descent direction d that's one aspect of a descent method then the other one is a line search which says how far in the descent direction you go and you try to find the optimal value and then you move there and you get your next iterate so just very briefly recapitulating what we did the last time so everybody is on the same page the the last thing we did um uh, one week ago was convergence analysis of Newton, right? We talked that there are these two phases of convergence. There's the phase one, the damped Newton phase, and there's the phase two, which is the quadratically convergent phase. So once you are in the phase two, the convergence is very quick. Something like six iterations get you like a perfectly or highly accurate solution. So Newton's method works super well to the point that the li uh, some people even skip the line search. Uh, so you always use the, the step size of one because Newton gives you a very good estimate of the optimal line search uh, step. That's the uh, alpha equal one. Some of the older papers were using it. Still, some people use that because if you are doing integration, then you have the luxury of being able to reduce your time step. So if this alpha equal one is not working, then you can... Um, so uh, then you can always, instead of reducing the alpha, you can instead reduce the time step, okay? So that's how it connects to the integration we talked about before. If you were at the graphics <coughs> lunch last um, Tuesday, Nia was talking about adaptive time stepping methods, which is basically, which is exactly that idea. They, they, they do full step of Newton, meaning they always make the step uh, in the full D vector, okay? So it's from X0, you would do X0 plus D, and that would be your X1. So there's no alpha, or alpha is one, if you will. Also the original, like, or the classical Barak-Witkin paper that was also this alpha one kind of idea. Recently I read a cool paper from Jim Blinn, which is one of the Utah graphics pioneers about Newton's method, actually, how they used it for some geometry problem. And he had a funny quote in the paper saying, I guess it's what was he saying? So basically saying, that Newton works extremely well. If it converges slowly, you probably did something wrong. <laughs> oh yeah, and this was, this was his lesson from that paper. He actually did a mistake in computing the derivatives. It was computing sines and cosines. You know what I'm talking about, right? Because uh, you're implementing that. Sines and cosines, but instead of radians, you plug in degrees. So there was like one 180 over pi, and that, that of course should show up in the chain rule. So if you get the derivatives wrong, then these things don't work so well. And sometimes you don't, it doesn't like crash or something, it just converges not that fast. So if it does not converge that fast, there, that's a good opportunity for you to go check your code, okay? If you didn't make some bug, just as Jim Blinn did back, back in the 80s. It's kind of cool that like back in the day, uh, these guys actually wrote in the paper what they did wrong. <laughs> These days people don't do that anymore. It, like you just pretend everything is like beautiful, everything just works just fine. It's not the case, but <laughs> What's that? I forgot the degree radians. Yeah, yeah. 
And I think it's useful to tell others, right? Because others will necessarily make the same mistake, right? So, and you also you can, even if they don't, you can learn from the mistakes of others, right? As opposed to doing your own mistakes. So let's talk about when Newton breaks down, okay? So uh, Jim Blim was actually only partially correct because there are some situations where even perfectly implemented Newton, actually even in exact arithmetics in this theoretical case, <coughs> when it still may not work very well, okay? It's not a panacea, Newton's method. It's a very powerful method, but you have to use it uh, carefully. So the first, and we talked about a little bit last time, the first case is when a G is highly nonlinear. was to be more precise when the Lipschitz constant is too high. So Newton works well if the function g can be reasonably approximated by a quadratic function. If that's not the case, if you have some crazy nonlinear materials like, like the Neohookian material we'll talk about later with like some logarithm square terms, these terms can grow very quickly and this can sometimes lead to problems in Newton's method even if everything is perfectly convex, okay? So what happens is that the phase one can be taking a lot of iterations, even though you are doing perfectly, correctly implemented Newton's method. The good thing is that this does not often happen in practice, and if it does, then you can change your material model. Then you don't have to be using this fa fancy Neohookian, or there are there is a string of papers on how to actually hack, if you will, the material model, so these nonlinearities don't come back to bite you, okay? So this in practice is usually not that much of a problem. What is a big problem in practice is the non-convexity, okay? G is non-convex. And this is a much uh, more practical situation. This happens almost always, okay? In fact, I would say the reverse is true. If your G is convex only in toy cases, okay? Like the harmonic oscillator, Jing created these diagrams of these fishes and octopuses. Uh, that was a convex uh, G, but that's kind of like a didactic case. Almost any practical uh, G in, in coming from numerical integration will be minimizing will be non-convex, okay? So the first thing I would like to talk about today is how to safeguard Newton's method so it survives non-convex G, okay? So first I will need to explain you what actually goes wrong in Newton's method if you do have a non-convex G. So let's first, um, let's first look when G is convex, how everything works beautifully, okay? So first, first let's look how it should work and then uh, how we can make it work even in the non-convex case. So let's look at a a didactic example when we have just a scalar function and we are going to be minimizing this, okay? Let's say the function is a convex, so this is my g of x, this is my x, so just a 1D thing, right? I probably want a minimum, which is somewhere around here. And if I get a starting point somewhere around here, so this would be my x0, the way you can uh, imagine that Newton works, it finds the locally optimal quadratic approximation, so fits a quadratic function, looks like something, it needs to be a parabola, right? and then minimizes that. So the, the minimum of this, that's where the full Newton step would go, okay? So let's say we just do this, we just do the alpha equals one version, so no line search. So in that case, we move right here, okay? So this would be our x1 right here, okay? So that means now we are here and we do the same thing again. We do, that's another iteration of Newton, okay? We do another quadratic approximation. Now it will look a little bit better. Now it will look something like this. And again, we find the minimum of the quadratic approximation and move there, okay? So our next iterate is gonna be here. This would be now x2, right? Again, so now we are here. This is the, this is the, if you want, this is the g of x2. And again, you do a quadratic approximation and, and so on, right? So here, even if you are taking the, the full steps, the alpha equal one, you pretty quickly converge to the solution, which is here, okay? So that's the beautiful convex case. That's uh, when things work very well. Now, in the non-convex case, we will have a problem, okay? And uh, maybe let me first explain you uh, why the non-convexity is an actual problem, okay? So I like to show a super simple example of just a mass spring system with just two springs. 
which already which clearly demonstrates the non-convexity. Okay, so basically it's to say that all these practical potentials we are using uh, usually have non-convexity in them, okay? So let's uh, take a look at one specific example to make this concrete as opposed to wishy-washy. So the setup, the mechanical system I want to be simulating, it looks like this. So let me explain that a little bit. So this is a toy system, okay? It has two springs. There is spring number one, there is spring number two, and there are three particles. This is the N1, this is N2, this is N3, like nodes, if you will. So this is like a mass spring system. And this N1 and N3, they are completely fixed, okay? There is some wall here, there is some wall and some wall over here, and this N1 and N2, they are just constrained to stay on the wall, okay? Now this N2, to make things simpler, I can say it can only move along the x-axis, okay? So it cannot go up and down, that's just to make it simple. It can only move in the x-axis, okay? So you can imagine there's some railing or something if you want to give it some physical, physical meaning, okay? So this is a system that has only one degree of freedom, because I have three particles, but I <laughs> took out... It is in 2D, but I took out all the degrees of freedom here by saying, hey, this is fixed to the wall, this one is fixed to the wall too, and here I left only one degree of freedom, and it's the x-coordinate, okay? So the only way this system can move, it can move left and right on the x-axis, and if it moves um, right, then these springs will be stretching, okay? Now, the key thing is that the rest length of these springs is square root of 2 square root of 2, okay? So this situation corresponds to x equals 0. Let's imagine that this is x equals 0, okay? And this length is 1, okay? The n1 uh, is uh, one unit of distance, a one meter away from the x-axis, okay? So in this, in this configuration, the springs are actually compressed, okay? If you want to see how it looks like when the springs are non-compressed, I have another picture for that. That's this one. So that's the B case. So here the X, so here would be the, the zero, right? And this X is at one. And if I'm at one, uh, the springs are at their rest length, okay? I said that the rest length of the springs is square root of two, but the length of the spring, well, let's, let's compute the length of the spring. Oh, you tell me what is the length of the spring depending on x. That's just a Pythagorean theorem, right? So what is the what is the spring length? That's what we will need because then the next thing I'm gonna say, we will, we will give Hooke's law on these springs and that's how we define our potential. So, um, so if I am at position, so I guess you can draw like this, this simple diagram, right? So here is my here is my x. You know that this thing is one, right? And this so this is one. This is x, and this is what I'm asking for. So how much is that? That's a high school. Um, yeah, exactly. So this thing is uh, square root of one plus x squared. Exactly, just Pythagorean theorem, right? So from this we see that if x is one then this is exactly square root of 2. So in this configuration, there is zero potential energy stored in the system because both of the springs are at their rest length, okay? There, there exists a, a symmetric configuration at, at minus 1, of course, when the springs would go the opposite way, right? They, they would look like this. Same, same situation, just, just mirrored. Now, the funny thing, and that's, that's why this serves as an example of non-convexity, is that these two springs are compressed for x equals 0, right? Because let's, let's write the Hooke's law, or you tell me, so what, what does Hooke's law say about the potential of those springs? So potential, what is the potential of one spring according to Hooke's law? So you guys should know that. <laughs> So we know this is the current length of the spring. We know this is the rest length of the spring, right? There is some stiffness. You can say the stiffness is one or whatever. The stiffness doesn't really matter here because I assume, I, as, as long as I assume both of the springs have equal stiffness, let's assume that they have the same stiffness, okay? So what does Hooke's law say for the potential of e, for one, one, one of the springs? The potential. The potential.
So the, how does Hooke's law work? Yep. Exactly, James, right? That's that's yeah. the exact idea. You take the current length of the spring, you subtract the rest length, and, and, and you square that, right? That's that's it. And you give it one half just to make the derivatives a little bit easier. And you could the one could be some arbitrary stiffness if you want it. Uh, so this is the current length of the spring, x squared plus that's that's this, minus the rest length, and then you square that. Okay, that's that's Hooke's law. So because of both of the springs are exactly the same and they have, for a given x, they have exactly the same deformed length, right? Then this thing, this potential is identical for both of the springs, so I can just sum them together. So I can say the potential of the entire system, my Ex, let's say potential energy, that's why E, so that would be just simply twice this, right? That's kind of silly. So that's minus square root of 2, the whole thing squared, okay? And that is my point here. Let me erase this Pythagoras thing. If you plot this, so let's plot this. I have a graph prepared. This is how the E looks like. Okay, so this is, so if this is X, this is my E of X, okay? And that's it's exactly this function, just plot it. And if you think about it, it totally makes sense, right? Because if, if x is zero, there is some stored energy in the springs because they are both compressed, right? As you move, let's say then, then we move uh, to the right, so we are increasing the x, it actually gets minimized when the x hits one, right? Because that's the case when both of the springs have their rest length, so zero potential. Right? There is no energy stored in the system. You can think about it as like a bowl, right? When the bowl is drawn, there is a lot of energy stored in it. When, it. when it's released, in this case, it's released for x equals 1 or minus 1. Okay, So that's where you get the 0. And of course, if you keep stretching, if you keep going further to the right with x, then the springs keep stretching, and you can keep stretching them as far as you want. They will never break. That's the Hookian assumption. So, and instead, the potential will just be growing to infinity. Okay, so that's 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 how this that's why you get this thing, and of course it's perfectly symmetric around zero, right? Because the situation is, is perfectly symmetric if you go to plus x or minus x. Okay, so that's why the potential looks like this, and clearly this function is non-convex, right? That's 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 very obvious. If <clears throat> Oh, actually, and there is like a funny, um, so if you look at this function, it has ex exactly three critical points, right? At minus one, zero, and one, right? So at plus minus one, we have, of course, local minima, actually global minima even, right? Local minima. Physically, that's, that's an aside, but it's interesting to think what does that mean physically. Physically, that's a stable equi equilibrium, okay? <coughs> Stable equilibrium means that if you perturb it a little bit, if you like give it a little push, it will come back to the equilibrium, okay? Now the x equals zero, that's a local maximum. And that's a funny point of unstable equilibrium, okay? Because what happens if the system is exactly in this configuration as shown here, right? If it's exactly there, it doesn't go anywhere, right? The force would be exactly zero, right? Because it's it's right here, right here it's like it's like completely flat. But the equilibrium un is unstable because the moment you a fly lands on it or you, you touch it very gently, it immediately pops and settles in one of the stable equilibria instead, okay? So this is actually a big deal in structural engineering for obvious reasons, because if you are building a building, you want to be in the stable equilibrium, right? You don't want it to collapse whenever a butterfly or something lands on it, right? <laughs> but that's, uh, so that's kind of just to explain the physics of this. What I want to use this for is to explain how Newton method fails on, on this very primitive, very didactic example, okay? So already here, Newton method fails because this function is non-convex. If you look at it, if you look at it, you can compute the first and second derivative of this function. It's a little hairy, so I, I won't do it. But then you can find uh, 
where the second derivative, this e prime prime of x, where is it actually negative, okay? And if you do it, you find out that this happens for x roughly between minus 0.51 and 0.51. It's not exactly 51, it's like 5098, some, something like this. It kind of looks like half, but it's not exactly a half. There are some funny square roots and, and stuff like this, but it's kind of, you, you could do this, right? This is kind of standard calculus exercise, compute the second derivative of it and determine when it's negative and when it's positive. So what that means is that there is about this range, it's roughly one half, there's a range like this, which corresponds to range like over here, where this function is concave, okay? The second derivative is zero. The curvature is negative of that function, okay? It's like, the, uh, it's like, a, like a hill, okay? In these other regions outside of that interval, like if, if you go over here, then it's like a bowl. So on, on these intervals could actually be convex, okay? Because then the curvature is nice and positive, okay? <clears throat> So if we start Newton's method from here, for example, is it going to work? It will. It, it definitely will, right? It will be the same situation as here, right? Newton will happily be descending uh, until, until, it, until it gets to the stable equilibrium here, right? Now the trick, the, the problem is if you start somewhere in, in, this, in this region, okay, what is going to happen with Newton's method? That's, that's, my, that's my key message in this example. If you start in that interval where the second derivative is negative here, what is Newton's method gonna do? It, exactly, exactly. And that's completely unphysical, right? Because uh, the physical system cannot increase its energy out, out of nowhere. Here, we are kind of... Hmm? That's a great question. It totally can overshoot. And that's why in general you want to be doing the line search. Okay. Here I gonna here I draw the nice situation. Okay. It wouldn't have to be like this. It could happen that this minimum of this red curve would be actually after the, the actual minimum of the function, right? Like let me let me see if I can draw some example. Let's see that let's see that or in the non-convex would be kind of easy, right? That I would say that the minimum would be somewhere here. And maybe if I did, and let's extend it here, and if I started here, then maybe my quadratic approximation would, oh, sorry, I can't draw this. The idea is that the quadratic approximation would be something like this, and it, it totally can overshoot, okay? It doesn't happen all that often, <laughs> but in theory it can happen. And that's why in general you want the, the line search there. But actually, let's let's take a look. What happens here if you if uh, what happens here with uh, did I answer your question? <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so what happens here when we do Newton's method? What happens? Newton does what it always do. It fits a best fit quadratic approximation, right? But because the second derivative here is negative, the parabola is going to be the mountain type parabola, right? So it's gonna look like kind of like this, okay? So indeed, if you take a full step of Newton, it's actually going to increase the potential, okay? And that's really bad because we are, we are trying to decrease it, okay? So that would be without line search, right? If you had line search, that the line search would pick a step size of zero, okay? Because if this is, this is an ascent direction. Newton now gave you, due to the non-convexity, due to the negative curvature, it gave you an ascent direction. So any reasonable line search would have to kill that direction, at which point your algorithm is not making any progress, okay? So this is something you need to uh, account for in your code, because if you don't, it's not going to work, okay? And it can happen even in such a primitive case such as these two springs. If you think this, this is actually not a contrived example, in practical simulations, we have something like claw simulation, like a sweater, that happens all the time. Because this, this uh, kind of buckling instability physics that's how wrinkles are formed, okay? The, the material resists compression, so instead of uh, compressing, it buckles out of plane. That's exactly how wrinkles are formed. So this is, this is actually a behavior you want to account for in your simulator because you want these emergent wrinkles if you are doing cloth simulation, right? It happens also in different types of simulation. Just, just cloth is a convenient example. 
So yeah, but Newton doesn't work. So we have to make it work somehow. By the way, there is another funny case, which is even slightly trickier. What if you are right at the inflection point? What is an inflection point? It's where the, well, the thing could be zero. Exactly. That's where the, there is a point at, that's exactly the minus 0 0.5098, something like this. And at that point, the second derivative is exactly zero. That's an inflection point. Okay. What would Newton do there? If you happen to be so unlucky to just start it right at the inflection point, it's not very likely, but just as a thought experiment. <coughs> How? Yeah, how would the quadratic approximation look like of that function at? Exactly, it would be. It would not be. It would be like a degenerate quadratic, right? I guess it would. It would be exactly a line, right? So then, actually, minimizing that doesn't even make sense because it would bring you to infinity. Okay. So whenever Newton is computing this, that would that corresponds to the fact that the Hessian is not invertible. Okay, meaning basically meaning you're dividing by zero. So in this case, it fails even numerically, okay? At, at some point in your code, you would have a division by zero. So that would actually throw an error, which is actually a little bit better than just taking the wrong stat, which could otherwise happen, okay? If, if, if <laughs> you don't take any precautions, then it would actually be a maximizing it, would not give you any error, it just would give you an absolutely non-physical result. Okay, so this is, that's why I'm kind of making a big deal out of it to make sure that your code is correct <laughs> and robust to these uh, slight non-convexities. These, convex these non-convexities are not so bad in practice because it kind of, the only thing kind of it determines is what direction do you go in your wrinkle. And th this really kind of is like on the level of wrinkles. Unfortunately, I don't have a better theoretical handle of this. I would still like to develop like a better theory to say this is a mild type of non-convexity as opposed to some like really bad types of non-convexity that could like render the problem and be complete or something like that. So this is kind of benign non-convexity, but still you have to safeguard your algorithm, because otherwise it would not work. I'm repeating it like seven times just to get that message across. Okay, so what are we, so in, so this was a toy example, right? In the general case, when we have a function g from rn to r, this, this situation will, will manifest itself as either indefinite or singular Hessian. Okay, let me write it down here. So in practice, when you are in Rn, then it can happen that your Hessian at your current iterate can be indefinite or singular. Oh, is everyone clear what I mean by that. So the Hessian is, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about linear algebra. The Hessian is an n by n real symmetric matrix, right? So we know that uh, eigen decomposition exists, so I can do eigen decomposition q, lambda, qt, that's to real eigen decomposition exists, that's from linear algebra, where this lambda matrix is the matrix of eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda 2, up to lambda n. Okay, now can you um, remind us of what indefiniteness means and what singularity means in terms of these eigenvalues? Yeah, that's, that's important. Okay, so I will, I will write it down. It's, it's, it's kind of... So, if any of the lambdas is zero, then it's singular. Okay, is it clear why? Because in, now you have, once you have it in this form, we are actually, we are not interested in the Hessian itself, we are interested in the inverse Hessian, right? Because we are actually applying the inverse Hessian to the gradient. Invert, once you have the eigen decomposition, then the inverse is easy. What is the inverse of the Hessian in this form? It's Q lambda inverse Q transpose, right? So basically, all you are doing are inverting this diagonal matrix. Okay, I mean, this is a diagonal matrix. So there are zeros everywhere else. This is just the diagonal matrix of the eigenvalues. So of course, if any of the lambdas is zero, you cannot invert it because you would be divided by zero. Okay, that's what I meant before. Now, if all, 
if all lambda i's are strictly greater than zero, then we say that the matrix is positive definite. It is symmetric and positive definite. Sometimes you can see this uh, acronym SPD, that means symmetric positive definite, okay? If it is, can you still see that? Yeah, if it's uh, non-strictly uh, greater than zero, then we say it's positive semi-definite. Okay, so positive semi-definite is kind of like positive definite, except that it includes the singular cases, okay? And indefinite, indefinite <coughs> means that there is some i different from j, such that one lambda i is less than zero and lambda j is greater than zero. So there are both positive and negative eigenvalues. In, in that case, you say it's indefinite, the matrix. Uh, so, in the, in the, if G is uh, convex, the indefiniteness cannot happen, okay? If G is convex, it can be at least positive semi-definite, and if it's strongly convex, it needs to be positive definite to Hessian at any point, okay? Uh, this, this situation I demonstrated in this 1D example in higher dimensions in Rn, that corresponds to indefinite Hessians at certain points, okay? Here, actually, here you have a Hessian too. The Hessian is just one by one matrix. In the 1D case, the Hessian is just the second derivative, okay? So actually, you have indefinite indefiniteness on exactly this interval, this minus 0.51 roughly to 0.51, okay? And in this, in this case, it's indefinite. Whenever the Hessian is indefinite, you are running the risk that Newton will give you an ascend direction as opposed to descend direction, okay? So in this case, you need to do something. Whenever the Hessian is singular, you also need to do something because you cannot even invert, okay? Because the, the inversion is not defined. So the question is, what are we gonna do in those cases? And it's even a little bit harder because computing the eigen decomposition is something you usually cannot afford, okay? because uh, in n dimensions, the complexity of this is n cubed, and that's what you don't wanna do. If you think about it, if you have like 10,000 vertex cloth, right? It's 10 to five, so n cubed would be 10 to 15, so that's quite a lot. <clears throat> so you, don't, you, don't, you don't actually don't want to compute the eigenvalues just to find out which of the cases it is, okay? In the general case, you know sometimes it can be indefinite, so you need to find a way how to survive the indefiniteness. Okay, even actually without checking for it. So what do we do? Any, any ideas? <laughs> what to, how to make sure the Newton's method, how to modify the Newton's method so it works despite the fact that G can be indefinite and regular Newton could be giving you a send directions by mistake due to the non-convexity. Which, by the way, when you run like a cost simulation or something, this will be happening. This happens quite frequently in our practical experiments. You couldn't check if x is in that. You, could you compute that range for an appropriate x value? That you, might not be what you're asking. But. You can, but only in simple cases like this. If you have like a cloth, then the range would not be an interval then it would be some subset of the degrees of freedom. So it'd be a subset in like 10,000 dimensions. So that would get fairly complicated. You can do uh, something though, but as far as I know, that has not been done yet. That's like a little research project on my list to actually generalize this analysis to multiple dimensions. As far as, that's a great idea, uh, but it needs to be done. I don't think it has been done as far as I know. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be on the next one. <laughs> Uh huh. That's a great idea. Yes, and that's basically how this uh, how this matter mm -hmm. works. In general, they are called definiteness fixes. Okay. In in physics based animation, in like optimization, they are called inexact Newton methods. Basically, the idea, just like you said, the idea is to hack the Hessian, if you will so that it gives you a, a descent direction, right? So remember, the, uh, Newton, Newton's method is just an example of a descent method, okay?
okay? Gradient descent did not have any of these problems, okay? The gradient was always a descent direction, unless we were done, at which point there is no, no need to do anything else, okay? So gradient descent did not have this problem. Actually, that might be a good good way to think about it, right? If we, if we think if we write down a gradient descent just next to Newton, okay, so this would be like d Newton, and this and the d g that would be that's just the negative gradient, right? So erase this. It's a good way to uh, look at the problem. So you can also uh, say that this is minus identity the gradient of g at x k right and when you, when you kind of compare it to what Newton had so this is what gradient descent really does it really kind of puts their identity which means not putting there anything but um, that always works okay this does not always work okay so the obvious idea is to do some blend between them okay so what do we want we want to make sure that our descent direction is going to be a descent direction, okay? From the last time, we know what the criterion for this is, right? What is the what is the way to decide? If I give you a descent direction D, how will you test whether that is a descent direction? That's, I guess, the first thing you could do, right? If there is a Newton thing and you know it, does, it can sometimes fail, the first thing you could do is to at least write a test there, and if it fails, then like output a warning or something, right? It's already much better than not doing anything. So what would be the test, the assert, or... So this is, I, I give you a D, descent direction. That's what we had the last time, right? We are at some point XK. We always are somewhere. We are doing an iterative method. At that point, Newton gives you a descent direction D. And you need to do a dot product. So you compute this. You would a dot product with your gradient, okay? And that thing needs to be negative if D is a descent direction, okay? So this is how you test for a descent direction. And that kind of tells you when, uh, when Newton is working, right? Because if I plug in for D the Newton descent direction, so that's then uh, inverse Hessian times the gradient. If I plug this in there, so I transpose everything, so that the gradient transposed with minus, uh, then there is the Hessian g inverse it's already symmetric so i don't have to transpose anything okay and here is the gradient so this needs to be a uh, negative okay so if yep sorry you said that a definiteness fix is also called something else oh um in inexact newton method or modified i think newton's methods yeah. I think that's what the optimization literature, like if you read something on non-convex optimization, like the book by Nosedal and Wright, I think they, that, that's how they call it. And if, if you read physics-based simulation paper, they usually call it definiteness fixes. And I will explain, explain why. Uh, so if the Hessian is a positive definite, the inverse is also a positive definite, right? Because if all my lambdas are nice and positive, if I invert them, they will also be nice and positive, okay? So that's, that's okay. And you also know that if I have a matrix which is symmetric positive definite, and I do x, t, a, x, then this needs to be strictly more than a zero, uh, for if x does not happen to be exactly the zero vector, okay? So this tells you that if uh, the Hessian is positive definite, this is always true, okay? Which is one way of saying that if the Newton is working on a convex objective G, then it always gives you a descent direction, okay? Now the question is what to do when the Hessian is not positive definite, okay? And that's why this is called the definiteness fix. You kind of fix the definiteness of that, okay? So the idea is kind of, kind of simple. You basically replace, instead of using the Hessian itself, you replace it with some matrix A, which is a speedy, okay? Symmetric positive definite.
and what is the easiest way of doing it? So the so the idea is so imagine you are at some iterator at x, you computed the Hessian, okay? Imagine for a second that somehow you detected it's indefinite. And by the way, this this already gives you like a computationally efficient way of detecting that things went wrong, right? The eigen decomposition you probably cannot afford to do because it's based too slow, it's n cubed. But you already have the descent direction computer and computing this dot product is a joke, right? So if, if you come, this is something you can and probably should compute in your code. <laughs> the line search is probably computing this anyway, by the way. So you already probably, when you are implementing Newton's method, you already have a code that computes that, right? So if you if you detect that this is this is, uh, this is not true this this condition is not satisfied then you have an ascend direction and you have to you have to do something okay and what you're gonna do you're gonna do a definiteness fix on the Hessian you replace it with a matrix that is similar but is uh, symmetric positive definite so one way you can look at it from like a matrix group theory perspective would be projection on the space of positive uh, semi, uh, symmetric positive definite matrices okay usually you don't do exact projection because this is kind of a hack only so you kind of just find some uh, matrix that resembles the hessian but is symmetric positive definite okay so how would you do that the definiteness fix so let's imagine for a second we do have the eigen decomposition okay so we can we actually know what the Q lambda and QT is. If I gave you the eigen decomposition, how would you do a definiteness fix? If you had the eigen decomposition, yeah. could you just um, replace the, the zero or negative eigenvalues with values of one? Yes, you can replace it with one. You can also replace it with like 0.1 or 0.001, right? You can replace. You just need to replace it with a positive number. That's that's a great idea. Yes. Wait, you are James. You are for Why? How did I? How did I confuse you guys? <laughs> I'm working on the same project. I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> so yes, uh, if the lump, if if so, if you where to compute the eigen decomposition, then you just look if there are some zeros or below zeros and you clamp them with some epsilon, okay? That's one way how you could do a uh, definiteness fix. Now the problem is that you actually don't want to be computing this eigen decomposition. So instead, uh, the easiest, easiest definiteness fix is to add a constant times identity, okay? So say, hey, my A is now gonna be the Hessian plus a constant times identity. Because if you do this, right, I said that the Hessian, it, it, you, the, the eigen decomposition always exists, okay, even if you did not compute it, right? So I can write it there even if we actually did not figure out what the Q and lambda is. But this is nevertheless still true, right? The identity I can write as Q, Q transpose because that's an orthonormal matrix. It's an eigen decomposition, okay? So this whole thing I can write as Q a lambda plus C <coughs> identity Q transpose, okay? This is sometimes called Tikhonov regularization in like a statistical context. And the whole idea is to just add a multiple of an identity. Of course, the C should be positive, right? For this to make to make any sense. And if you add this, you are essentially directly adding this constant C to all of the lambda i's, okay? So all you need to make sure that C is greater than the minimum of all the eigenvalues and if you do that, then this matrix A defined like this is going to be symmetric positive definite. Would it be greater than the mean of the absolute value? Oh, yes, you are. Actually, right, 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 with, with, with a minus, yeah. Actually, no, that then made. What we need to do, we need to pick. You still need to uh, minus, right? Because that's going to be negative. So basically, like the let's not overthink it, right? The, the eigenvalues can be something like this, right? And that can be like I don't know minus one. That can be zero. It could be fifteen, like fifty-three, right? So basically, you just need to add more than this, right? To make 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 everything go above zero strictly. Once once you do that, then A becomes a positive definite. And then, uh, and then you compute this d. So this would be d Newton, right? And that would be d, I don't know, fixed Newton. 
and that would be uh, minus a inverse the gradient, right? If you plug it into this formula, then you will of course see that this is always less than zero, so you are always getting a descent direction, okay? Now there is of course a little bit of a problem in how to compute the right C, right? Oh, here is actually a good question. What if I, what if I said, oh, I wanna be careful, I wanna be conservative. So why don't I set the C to something like really high? Okay. Or another way, uh, or maybe a little bit a better way to think about it, <coughs> Let's say that the scale doesn't matter because then let's say you do the line search afterwards or uh, so we could also do it like this right we could also divide the hessian by c and then just add identity to it there'll be a different way to do definiteness fix what would happen if the c went to infinity if you say let's be very careful let's make sure that's always going to work Exactly, exactly. <clears throat> then it would de degenerate to gradient descent, okay? Because the, w the way you can look at this definite, this is the basic, like the Tikhonov uh, type definiteness fix. It essentially is a blend between the original Hessian, that's what pure Newton would be using, and the identity matrix, right? As I showed you here, the identity matrix, that's essentially what gradient descent is using, okay? So it's a blend between the two. So if you go all the way, you end up doing gradient descent which always works even for non-convex functions. The problem is it can be converging very slowly, okay? So that's why we are in this business of like doing this definiteness fix because you wanna be as close as possible to the original Hessian, but not so close that Newton would stop working, okay? That's, that's, that's the trick here. So you wanna determine a, a nice C, <laughs> not too high uh, and needs to, but needs to be sufficiently large so it, so it kills all the negative or zero eigenvalues, okay? Actually, trust region methods, I think, do a little bit better job in like picking the C, essentially. That's the different class of optimization methods. We are talking here about descent methods. In trust region methods, it essentially boils down to the same stuff, except that the heuristics on choosing the C are probably a little bit, a little bit better. So I'll tell you later, um, uh, how to actually pick the C's. I guess um, I can tell you already like an easy way how we implemented it. It's not, not the best way, but it's a way that works. Basically, you can try it, okay? You can call your linear system solver on this. You do this test. If that test fails, you know you have too low C. So you know you need to increase your C, right? So then you increase your C, try again, see if the test passes, okay? If the test passed, then you can use the same C to sort of bootstrap the process in the next iteration because the C that probably worked before the previous iterate will probably still be a good, good guesstimate, okay, for the next one. Yep. Would it be good to choose a C where the minimum value becomes just barely, the minimum eigenvalue becomes just greater than zero? So it's not too high, but it's just enough. Would that be optimal? So that's where it gets a little bit tricky, right? Because you don't wanna make it like something super small, right? Because then you will be still inverting the matrix. You'll be compute, you know, here, you'll be inverting the A. So you don't wanna be inverting something that is close to singular because then you could get into like numerical precision issues, right? That's a good, great point though, actually I meant it to say that and I forgot. In, the, in this figure, if you are not exactly at the inflection point, like here, if you are just close to the inflection point, what happens? You have some curvature, but it's super tiny curvature, right? So technically speaking, you do have a full quadratic thing, but that quadratic thing almost looks like linear, okay? The curvature is so low. So what that, what that does, if you actually do it, then your descent direction is probably gonna be crazy large, right? Because here you have something close to zero, you're inverting it, and you're multiplying with something. So if you had something like 10 to minus 15, after the inversion of 10 to 15, that gets multiplied with the gradient. If there is some non-zero, you get some ginormous step, in which case you entirely are at the mercy of your line search that you don't do this ginormous step. So that's that's why this is not, that, that's why there is no easy answer what this C should be, because it, 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 it can be like the smallest possible one that would that would still work. Transpose, and that would square the eigenvalues of the 
That's a pretty good idea. I never seen it before, uh, but it does make some sense. <laughs> so maybe that's worth looking into that some more. <laughs> I know that there are many other types of definiteness fixes. This is just the most basic one. Maybe you were just discovered a different type of definiteness fix and how that possible. I know there were some other other types of definiteness fixes described in the literature. If you, but that needs you to sort of dig deeper on how this G is exactly formed, okay? So the G is usually a sum of contributions of individual elements, right? Like here the G or <coughs> the, the potential energy, which is the big part of G, was the sum of the potentials of the two springs, right? Uh, so in, in general, it's a sum of certain parts and then you can do the definiteness fix on the parts itself. Uh, this will make more sense when we go into finite elements and I will talk about what the definiteness fixes are there, okay? And we also have a paper with Tintin, the projective dynamics, and that can also be interpreted as a special type of definiteness fix. Actually, even uh, in recent years in graphics, there's kind of, it's becoming like a popular topic and people are really looking into these um, definiteness fixes slash modified Newton methods also in the context of geometry processing. So people are trying to propose new types of uh, fixes because as, as you can see, this is really not perfect. <laughs> this still has many weaknesses. I, I, I think it's fair to say that it's, a, that it's an active area of research in at least in physics-based animation. So yeah, I think you are right to think about what other methods <laughs> would work there. All right, so the next thing I want to start today and then continue on Thursday. I think I need to do some more lectures now because the semester is running out pretty quickly. So what I want to talk about next is actually how to implement all this uh, efficiently, okay? So what I wanna talk about next is actual practical implementation of all this stuff. Practical implementation of Newton plus numerical linear algebra because that's what it boils down to. So uh, I told you and that's what a mathematician usually ends with that the Newton descent direction is just the minus Hessian inverse times the gradient, right? But how to actually implement this? So the first thing uh, you will probably do is instead of actually inverting the matrix, which could be a horrible idea in certain in, in many situations actually, you just pose it as a linear system solve. Okay, this is essentially a problem of the type AX <coughs> equals B, where the A is my Hessian or the modified Hessian, right? The, the definiteness fixed uh, Hessian, quasi Hessian, if you will. And uh, on the right hand side, the B that's the negative gradient. Okay, so this is a linear system solve. And this is um, the bottleneck of Newton's method. Okay, when we are talking about computation, about performance, computing this, solving for the descent direction, that's a clearly the bottleneck. That's the slowest part of the entire algorithm. Okay, so that's where all your optimization efforts should focus. Okay, you still, you still are doing line search and you're still doing some stopping criterion it turns out that these, those things are usually much faster than computing the descent direction that's solving the system of linear equations. That's, that's what this is. This is solving a system of linear equations, okay? So if you want to implement this efficiently, and that's essentially what the, the rest will be, I don't want to give you just the theory, like the theory would end there, right? Just like compute this and go, go figure how to actually do it. There are better and worse ways to do this. And there are actually many tricks if you want to do this efficiently, if you want this to run fast. So uh, first, this is the bottleneck of Newton's method. Actually, maybe um, let's compare it to gradient descent. Okay, in gradient descent, this is super fast. The A is essentially identity. So this costs nothing in gradient descent, okay? Uh, it's still better in most cases in physics simulation to use Newton's method, even though this is very expensive, but you need to do way fewer iterations than with gradient descent, okay? So that's kind of what, what most people in physics do. They You still pay the price of, of 
uh, doing this, or at least with some modification of the exact Hessian. So that, uh, but the advantage you have is all these beautiful things of Newton's method. You have the fast convergence, you have the affine invariance, uh, and it works very well in practice once you do the definiteness fixes. Okay. Oh, and probably the most important feature of Newton, which I already mentioned last time, but let me mention it quickly again, is that if you go to higher and higher numbers of variables, if you go to million variables, the number of iterations of Newton's method barely changes. Okay, it's usually on the order of 20. If you have everything implemented correctly, if you have, if it's like much more, then it's a good time to be looking for bugs, as Jim Lin <laughs> already cautioned in the 80s. But if everything is working, regard this could be ginormous system. Okay, this can be a million by million matrix, uh, and the Newton's method still converges to very precise solution in something like 10, 20, maybe a little bit more, but not much more than that iterations. Now, what becomes a problem if you are doing a nice high resolution simulation with million million variables? This linear system cell becomes really bad, right? If you are doing the naive way, if this A is a dense matrix, if A is an N by N matrix, what is the cost of doing uh, the, the most straightforward Gaussian elimination? What is the time complexity of that? Just to kind of give you an idea how this scales. The most obvious linear system solve. Oh yeah, that's already the memory is squared, right? Because the matrix is n by n, so you already have n squared memory. So by the way, if you if it's really a million, then this probably will not fit in your memory, okay? Because it will be 10 to 12, so that's already too much, okay? But uh, the time complexity, if you are doing Gaussian elimination, that's actually cubed, okay? So for a million, you can forget about it. You need to be very clever how you do it. And that's that's basically the next part I want to talk about because there are you can do it way faster than n cubed in all, all these cases we are talking about. Okay, you can make, make it way faster. You can in many cases even make it real time. All right, so I guess what I will do today is just an overview because I only have about like 15 minutes left. So I will. So what we need to talk about is how to actually implement this efficiently, okay? How to uh, quickly solve, quickly numerically solve systems of linear equations. There are two main classes of methods. There are iterative methods for solving systems of linear equations. So now we will be talking entirely about this, okay? That's the bottleneck of Newton's method. If you want all this running fast, you need to get this fast. So there are iterative methods, and then uh, there are direct solvers or direct methods. You have probably heard about all of them, okay? In, in both cases, we are talking about this, okay? We have an n by n matrix. Uh, sometimes you can even assume that it's symmetric, positive, definite. That makes the solvers a little bit easier to deal with. So you must have heard about some iterative methods for solving linear systems, right? There are some very popular ones. Did you have this, by the way, in some course? There is like usually linear algebra courses, but they usually don't tell you how to actually implement this stuff, how to actually get the numerical part of the linear algebra fast. Have you heard about Jacobi, Gauss-Seidel, multigrid, conjugate gradients? Those are all examples of iterative methods, okay? Jacobi. Gauss-Seidel, CG, meaning conjugate gradients, and I guess the fanciest of all of them is multigrid. And those are all iterative solvers for a system of linear equations, okay? So they work in the similar fashion like we are solving this, this, this very... Uh, Nonlinear problem or general optimization problem. We have some function g, we are, we are minimizing that. And we do this by doing a sequence of iterates. We start at some initial guess, then we compute x1, x2, x3. And if you're doing Newton, by the time you get to x20, you can expect to be done. Okay? Now, the iterative methods for solving linear systems, it's, it's the same idea. You start with some x0, then you do some x1, x2, x3, and eventually you converge to some xk 
such that this is almost exactly satisfied, okay? Now, the important thing to understand if you are actually implementing Newton's method with an iterative solver for linear systems, it's an iteration within an iteration, okay? So this, this iteration here for the linear system, that would be an inner loop in your actual solver, okay? Your outer loop is the descent method, okay? Compute descent direction, do line search, move. That's the outer loop. And in the inner loop, you would actually have another iteration just for computing the descent direction. Okay, so that's an iteration with an iteration. So it gets a little bit complicated, but uh, this is actually very popular and lots of people are using it. In scientific computing, they essentially exclusively use these iterative methods because if you are doing with some enormous data sets with like huge numbers of degrees of freedom, then the iterative methods uh, become uh, better. So what are the direct methods? The direct methods are essentially variants of Gaussian elimination. You might have heard about methods such as LU or LLT, which is also known as Kolesky decomposition. Those are all examples of direct solvers. And they, they solve the same problem. They also solve a system of linear equations. AX, they give you a solution uh, for a linear system, AX equals B. But they don't uh, do this business of creating a sequence of iterates, like the iterative methods. They just directly compute it, okay? By uh, doing some operations on, on the A matrix, typically they decompose the A matrix into a multiplication of simpler matrices which are easy to invert, and from this they compute the x directly, okay? There's no iteration involved. So that's the fundamental difference, I guess, that's, that's what I wanted to, uh, that's the message I wanted to convey in this overview. The fundamental difference is that these direct methods, they don't like uh, iteratively improve this x, getting more and more accurate solution. They just get an accurate solution up to machine precision in one shot. Okay, so there is no iteration involved. Does that make sense? Any question? Are those uh, exact sentences? They provide an exact solution? So, uh, yes, exact solution in exact arithmetics, right? There is always a rounding error. So, we are always implementing it on a computer that has flowed or double precision. And even like a plus of two floating or double uh, precision numbers makes a little bit of an error, right? So the direct methods always give you a solution up to machine precision, if they are actually implemented correctly, okay? If you do it wrong, then that actually might not be true. <laughs> but if you are just uh, using an existing solver, if you are using an LUD decomposition, LLT decomposition, you can expect to get always a solution up to machine precision, which is kind of moot because you always have things just up to machine precision anyway, okay? unless you are doing some like very specific type of thing, but you, nobody does that in this space, like doing rational arithmetic, <laughs> stuff like this. Now these iterative methods, uh, they can actually also iterate to pretty accurate solution, but they don't have to, you can stop them early, which is actually sometimes useful, because if you think about it, this is just an inner loop, okay? Of, of the, you, are, you still have the outer iterations, which does the des descent method, right? So you actually don't have to be computing super accurate descent direction, because then you just use it for one step and then you are computing a whole new descent direction, right? So if you make a little bit of an error in the descent direction, as long as, long as it's not too bad of a, an, as long as the descent direction is reasonable, then you actually don't have to have super accurate descent direction. Quick question, what would mm -hmm. the CG of conjugate gradients look like? Oh, CG? Okay, that's conjugate gradients. And I will talk about both of these things in much more detail because this is really important for uh, practical, um, if you really want to implement this. <laughs> and you kind of need to know about both of these methods because there is no clear winner. The direct methods in our experience, they work really well if you don't have too many degrees of freedom, okay? If you have like a thousand degrees of freedom or even a couple thousand of them on like modern computers, on like a laptop, these direct methods work super well, okay? Once you start going to higher and higher degrees of freedom, with the end being with like the, what the high performance computing guys do, 
then the direct methods uh, start to be uh, very memory hungry and the memory becomes a problem with the direct methods. So then usually you only can do an iterative method. And to make it even uh, more interesting, usually you do some kind of hybrid between the two. You do bit, a little bit of a direct method and a little bit of an iterative method kind of combined. Okay. In conjugate gradients, this is called preconditioning. So use some use some simple direct method to improve the convergence of your iterative method. Okay. So there are there are also overlaps between uh, the two. Okay. So the next thing I will talk about is um, basic, very basic numerical linear algebra. Let's see if I have. Yeah, I think I can can um, give you the quick story quickly. Numerical linear algebra. So this is really now about a practical implementation, okay? And the one message I wanted to get over is how uh, performant the modern computers are, okay? How fast is a typical laptop? CPU. I did these experiments on my not on this laptop, on another laptop. So um, one test is just solving a system of linear equations just like this, and that the A is an n by n matrix, and we can say it's dense. So in this case, we I can just run Gaussian elimination. And it has the cost has roughly n cubed. Okay. And if you run a highly optimized implementation, if you run like the MATLAB version of this or some or some nice solver, then you can basically assume that this is utilizing the CPU uh, to to the maximum. Okay. <coughs> so if you actually this is a good this is a good kind of thing to know. If n is ten thousand, okay. Do you have a rough idea how fast this is on a laptop? Solving with Gaussian elimination, dense things, uh, the, the, the simplest possible case, right? So the n cube, of, so if this is 10 to 4, right, then n cube will be 10 to 12, right? So this is roughly the number of flops, floating point operations the solver needs to do to crunch that, okay? Uh, do you know roughly how fast that that is on a on a regular laptop today? <laughs> I just did a test on my other laptop, and this this took this took something on the order of like twenty seconds. Okay, for ten thousand by ten thousand matrix. Actually, even already the memory is kind of huge, right? If if, if you if you think about it. Already just storing this this dense matrix that's uh, ten to the eight, so that's already quite a lot. But I want to talk about the time first. So this this solve took twenty seconds. It's roughly um, ten to twelve uh, floating point operations. So from this I can I can kind of compute. So if if I do ten to twelve flops divided by twenty seconds, so that gives me that my CPU I tried it on had roughly something like fifty gigaflops. Okay. That means 50 billions of um, arithmetic operations per second. Okay, so that's um, and that's a like a laptop, no, no, no fancy thing. If you talk about the GPU or some like um, more powerful uh, CPUs, you uh, can get two teraflops too. Okay. But uh, my main point here is that the problem is actually with memory. Memory bandwidth. If I, I, I test it on, my, on the same laptop, roughly like how long does it take to read uh, uh, memory? And it turns out that the memory system can read something roughly, very roughly, 10 gigabytes per second. This, by the way, I'll take all these numbers with like a pinch of salt. I just wanted to give you the idea of the order of magnitude. Okay, this is not like a hardware kind of kind of thing. But okay, ten gigabytes. Well, uh, one if you have floats, okay, that that translates to two point five billion 
floats. If you have doubles, because float has four bytes, right? If you have doubles, that's 1.25 1. Uh, 1. billion doubles, okay? And from this, you can immediately see what the problem is, right? In a second, the computer can read about a, a billion of doubles, but it can do <coughs> about 50 billion arithmetic operations, okay? So the problem is being able to feed the CPU, <laughs> Because the memory, that this is kind of what happened, right? The CPUs were getting faster and faster, and the memory was also getting faster, but not as fast. The speed of the memory <laughs> has, has, has been increasing much slower than the speed of the CPUs. So now, these days, it's all about keeping, figuring out how to keep the CPU busy. If you want to take advantage of all the RMA operations the computer can do, if, you, at, 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 if everything is uh, ideal, then you need to be very careful how to make sure the CPU is fed with data, okay? That's also why I picked this, this example of Gaussian elimination, because here uh, the, the memory in this case is, is squared, right? It, this is n squared memory, but the time is n cubed for, for Gaussian elimination, okay? So here it means that feeding the CPU, if you are smart about it, is not a problem because you have much more arithmetic operations. You have n cubed operations, you have 10 to the 12 operations, but you have only 10 to 8 uh, data to deal with, okay? So you can do this in a clever way. So you are actually reading the data in such a way that the CPU can be always busy with computations while the memory is being read. Okay, so that's that's why this is kind of also like a decent test of how many flops, gigaflops per second your CPU can do because the CPU uh, can be busy. Okay, uh, but this is not to be taken for granted, and that's actually one of the reasons why writing efficient numerical linear algebra code is difficult because you have to take care of all these like really hardware computer architecture. Kind, kind of details and there, there are many many other things going on right if you actually want to squeeze out all these flops you need to use all these simd instructions you want to use all the uh, cores in your computer optimally uh, so uh, the moral of this story is don't implement anything by this yourself okay use an already optimized uh, linear algebra um, implementation and that is called BLAS that's the that's the very basic level okay BLAS stands for basic linear algebra subroutines okay that's the very bottom level I'll, I'll talk more about in more detail about it uh, next time above BLAS is LAPAC so the BLAS uh, implements the very basic operations like matrix vector multiplication. La La LAPAC is like for matrix factorizations and sol solving system of linear equations. And that's a library above, above BLAS. Those are super standard um, numerical linear algebra routines. And if you grab a good implementation, it takes care of these all architecture things for you. Okay. So don't try to... Uh, yeah. And so BLAS and LAPAC are, are both... They, so this this is actually relevant for both iterative and direct methods. Oh. Okay, this is this is about a general. You are right. I, I gave the example of a direct method, and probably it's more relevant for direct methods. But even in iterative methods, you need to do things like compute dot products. Okay, so even even there, anytime you do some linear algebra on a computer, then you want to use. Uh, these linear algebra subroutines. So it's relevant for both iterative and direct methods. It's more critical for the direct methods, I would say, but we will, we'll, we'll get into details of those. I'll probably spend an entire lecture talking about direct methods and then about iterative methods because it's good to know about both. I'll tell you some a little bit more about BLAS and how, how, how that works. The, the, I guess what I want you to remember already is if you have, even if you're doing something simple, just like a matrix vector product or matrix matrix product, it would be super easy to code it yourself. Don't, okay? If you want, if you want to squeeze out all the performance from your computer, uh, use uh, an optimized implementation. <laughs> Unless you want to do your PhD in computer architecture, in that case, you want to dig deep in that and do just that. So, would a, a package like Eigen already uh, do this? Or, or Great this, question. Yeah, all these. You know, to connect yourself. All these packages come with some BLAS and, and, and LAPAC implementation. 
Sometimes you can even switch the blasts because there are there are several different implementations. For example, we had good experience with the Intel MKL blast, which is optimized guess guess what for Intel TPUs. It kind of does it, that. That kind of gets into details. Kind of doesn't matter which one you are using as long as it's a decent one. <laughs> We'll talk about it more and more next time, yeah. So whenever you're using some system, even MATLAB, right? This this test I actually did in MATLAB. What MATLAB actually, MATLAB is nothing but a GUI for uh, BLAS and LAPAC, okay? All, all it does actually, and those are actually free, uh, there are free libraries that implement all this. MATLAB, all it does, it actually calls that. That's where the computation happens anyway. All right?